What is it like to be a bat is an influential philosophical paper that was written to argue that the reductionist point of view won't help us understand the relation between mind and body and that it neglects to grant a satisfying explanation of consciousness. No doubt consciousness occurs in countless forms totally unimaginable to us on other planets in other solar systems throughout the universe. But no matter how the form may vary, the fact that an organism has conscious experience at all means, basically, that there is something it is like to be that organism. Fundamentally, an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it is to be that organism, something it is like for the organism. If physicalism is to be defended, the phenomenological features must themselves be given a physical account. But when we examine their subjective character, it seems that such a result is impossible. The reason is that every subjective phenomenon is essentially connected with a single point of view, and it seems inevitable that an objective physical theory will abandon that point of view. We can assume bats have experience because there is something that it is like to be a bat. We know that bats mostly perceive their surroundings by echolocation. This enables bats to perceive size, shape, motion and distance of an object. This is clearly a form of perception, but it's in no way similar to any of the senses we possess or any of the experiences that we have. This causes a difficulty to understand what it is like to be a bat. Sure we know how a bat functions and we can talk about how bat sonar works and at best we can imagine what it would be like for me to behave as a bat behaves. But that's not the question. We want to know what it is like for a bat to be a bat. And the difficulty is not just with bat sonar. Bats too feel pain, lust, hunger or fear. But also these experiences have in each case a specific subjective character which is beyond our ability to conceive. And if there is conscious life elsewhere in the universe, chances are we won't be able to describe what they experience and go through in everyday life. When we use the expression, what it is like, we can at best mean what in our experience it resembles. But we've been trying to know how it is for the subject himself. So it seems we have accepted that there are facts which could not ever be represented or comprehended by human beings, simply because our structure does not permit us to operate with concepts of the requisite type. Imagine a Martian scientist who has no understanding of human visual perception. That won't stop the Martian from understanding rainbow or lightning or clouds as physical phenomena, but he won't be able to understand the human concept of these things. This is because lightning, for instance, has an objective character that is not exhausted by its visual appearance. Nagel says, it may be more accurate to think of objectivity as a direction in which the understanding can travel. And in understanding a phenomenon like lightning, it is legitimate to go as far away as one can from a strictly human viewpoint. And this is what would be left of what it was like to be a bat if one removed the viewpoint of the bat. No presently available conception gives us a clue how a physical theory of mind accounts for the subjective character of experience. Nagel tells us, if mental processes are indeed physical processes, then there is something it is like intrinsically to undergo certain physical processes. What it is for such a thing to be the case remains a mystery. Despite all this, it would be a mistake to conclude physicalism must be false. Physicalism declares mental states are states of the body, mental events are physical events. But in such a hypothesis, what do the words is and are mean? When you say X is Y, we seem to understand how that can be true, but that's because of the conceptual or theoretical background that we have, that is not conveyed by is alone. For example, if you tell someone that all matter is really energy, he knows what the word is means, but he won't be likely to form a conception of what makes this claim true. Only theoretical backgrounds may lead one to such conclusions. When you say X is Y, sufficient theoretical framework must be supplied to enable us to understand it. 
It's the same when you declare that a mental event is a physical event. Something more than the knowledge of what the word is means is required. Strangely enough, we may have evidence for the truth of something we cannot really understand. Nagel gives us the example of a caterpillar that is locked in a sterile safe by someone unfamiliar with insect metamorphosis, and weeks later, the safe is reopened, revealing a butterfly. If the person knows that the safe has been shut the whole time, he has reason to believe that the butterfly is or was once the caterpillar without having any idea in what sense this might be so. And we are in such a position with regard to physicalism, 